And optimizations work, but for the wrong reasons. I've seen that and I was like, hmm. That sounds really interesting. Ever played a game with crazy amounts of stuff, yet running so smoothly? This is Unreal Engine, like I think. Behind that buttery smooth performance is more than just powerful hardware. I started as a graphics engineer almost 20 years ago. And Holy shit. since then, I've always been fascinated graphics with Graphics engineer. Okay, so that's basically what I'm into. I love graphics. Even though I was having issues with Bloom. But one shit. stands out as both incredibly simple, yet the reason why it works is more complex than most people realize. Mm -hmm. Let's examine one of the most effective optimization techniques available and understand uh -huh. it to the same level of depth that experience. Frustrum culling. I'm just tossing this out there because I might do. be wrong, but frustrum culling. start with the little world and we'll yeah. add a bunch of stuff to it. Mm -hmm. This will serve as our kind of test bed to show things off. So we'll keep things reasonably simple. Okay. Let's go ahead and add an object to the world here. So we've got our player and this object. Okay. The idea is relatively simple. This, this is unrelated, right? will have several versions, each being progressively simpler. Ah. So here's the most complex. Uh, LOD, level of detail. Or mm -hmm. detailed version of the object. And we can sort of pan the camera down the line, looking at the simpler and simpler versions. Mm -hmm. These will be called level levels of detail, of detail or yeah. LOD. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is, when we place one of these objects in the world, we'll start it nearby for convenience. Yeah. And the idea is, as the object gets further and further away from the camera, we cycle through the different levels of detail for that object. Yeah. So we're a bit further away, we switch to a lower level of detail. Mm -hmm. About a you bit can... further still. It's done really good. Hello, Mr. Amida. It's done really well. If it's done really well, you won't notice this effect, right? Uh, because you, you can see like the popping of the triangles. You don't want to see that, right? Well, and we can do that again. I'm pretty Switch sure there's blending between the two. Detail, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How many levels of detail games use is a bit of a toss up. Since authoring them takes artist time, you may only have enough budget to build. Yeah, so but you can compute this, can you not? Or at least Unreal Engine, I heard can compute level of detail, but they went further than, than to make this like crazy nanite thing, right? Yeah. The high and low level of detail, or you may have money to burn and you can build a half dozen versions of the asset. <laughs> this brings us to a really awesome optimization that's used quite a bit called mm -hmm. imposters. Okay. For many people, this is just another level of detail. Wait, wait, imposters is probably just a quad. A quad that looks at you. I, I think that's because imposter basically means it's not real. And what is not real? Well, just a 2D billboard, yeah. Or a whole other technique. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. Okay. Let's take these two objects here in the distance. Ah, uh, one From of them is a sprite. Point, what are the differences between Okay, the I think, wait. Which one is a sprite? I would assume it's the right one because the left one is so pixelated. You can see the pixels floating on the left and right while the right one is more stable. I think this is a texture. And the left one is the object. Those two. Not a whole lot. But mm -hmm. as we move forward, we can see that something is kind of off with one of them. This one looks perfectly normal. But uh, the other one is clearly just a picture that's rotating oh. with us. Shit, it was the other one. This God. is a billboard or <laughs> imposter. It was the other and one. And from far enough away, you really can't tell the difference. No, you can't. With a little bit of work, these imposters can be really advanced. You can render out normal maps along with the diffuse. You Damn. can render them out from multiple viewpoints and blend between them, giving you a highly versatile and incredibly low cost stand-in for the original asset. This scene here from my previous grass video features something like 50,000 wow, trees awesome. of various types. I wonder if he's done this in, is this Unreal Engine? Crazy. And it's trivially cheap to render due to most of them being imposters. The question it's now is, engine. why does this technique work so well? It's JavaScript 3GS. Okay. Well, the intuitive answer is that these models have fewer vertices. Mm -hmm. And so then it sort of makes sense that having fewer vertices equals doing less work on the GPU. But, but press for more information. Yeah, that this can't be wrong because vertices, well, yes, they take time. Um, most of the time is spent in the fragment shader, right? That, this is kind of where the explanation stops for many people. This answer isn't wrong per se, but at the same time, there's so much more going on here. Okay. If you were to go and buy a state-of-the-art GPU, they list their performance these days in teraflops. That's an absurd amount of computing power. 
Okay. So why does just reducing the number of vertices in the scene make such an outsized difference? There's more to the story. Back in the 90s, GPUs had what was called a fixed function pipeline, which mm -hmm. meant that the various stages of the GPU were set in stone. Ah, the hardware had different pipeline. units allocated to different tasks. Mm -hmm. What this meant practically was that resources weren't shared. It was more like an assembly line with things going in one end, going through a series of fixed steps, and then coming out fully processed on the other end. Mm -hmm. All this changed in around 2004 when AMD, or ATI at the time, for those of us who have been doing this for a long time now, developed the Xenos GPU for the Xbox 360. Okay. This would be one of the earliest designs that unified the shader architecture. Is that why the 360 was having so many issues with not starting? <laughs> Meaning that the shader processing Because unit... they made a new model, right? But it wasn't fully fledged out yet. It had the cool thing, but it wasn't done yet 100%. Bits of the GPU were shared between Vertex and Pixel shading duties. NVIDIA followed not too long after. I think it was around 2006 with the Tesla generation of GPUs, mm -hmm. their first unified shader architecture. <clears throat> Interesting. What this means is that the GPU can now perform sort of load balancing between the different types of processing. The GPU is free to dynamically allocate resources between, say, vertex and pixel processing, mm -hmm. leading to more efficient GPU utilization. Whereas okay. before, with the fixed function pipeline, it couldn't. So with that in mind, my uber-powerful fancy new GPU realistically shouldn't be bothered too much by the introduction of even a few million extra vertices, because doing one full-screen pass would be a few million pixels, mm -hmm. but wouldn't even make a small dent in performance. If vertices and pixels are basically shared now on the hardware, there shouldn't be a difference. Let's look at this example. Okay. I have this full screen effect going, like meaning it. that I have an expensive fragment shader running on the whole screen, every single pixel. Mm -hmm. I could be running anything. This could be changing the color, doing various blurs. In reality, there's so many things that modern games do as post effects that the exact contents of this shader isn't that important. The only important point here is that we're running at 100 FPS. Now, let's work through some numbers together to get a sense of the scale of the work the GPU is currently doing. So this screen that I'm recording is on 1920 by 1080. Yeah. So 1920 multiplied by 1080 is 2,073,600 pixels in total. It's quite a few pixels. Or let's pixels. round that to a cool 2 million pixels. <laughs> and I'm doing a ton of work in the pixel shader. Okay. Here in the vertex shader, it's incredibly bare. There's barely any... Yeah, vertex shader, let's see, it goes through the vertices and then, wait, the, wait, that's the, uh, wait, that doesn't look like JavaScript, guys. That doesn't look like JavaScript, that looks more like C++ code. What are you guys talking about? This is outside, this is in the shader. This is example vertex shader. Not a whole lot of happening here. It takes the in position and then it does the model view projection matrix or the projection model view matrix. Calculation. Maybe demonstratively, he's just making a version of C++. Yeah, very informative cakes. Shut the fuck up, bitch. He work in here. Okay. In fact, the fragment or pixel shader is doing a magnitude of more work than this. Mm -hmm. But Let's see. if I do something really dumb, just to illustrate a point, and make mm -hmm. a buttload of triangles, in fact, one quad for every pixel on the screen, so there's two million <laughs> pixels, that means we've got around four million triangles. Despite the awesome power of this GPU, the frame rate drops catastrophically. It absolutely eh? just grinds to a crawl. I don't really know what add quad means because he's not explaining the pipeline very well. Does that mean for every single pixel on the screen he's drawing one quad? But why is it drawing this image even? Like what does that quad mean? What is this quad drawing? Like I don't really... I don't really get it. So why is it that the raw power of our GPU doesn't translate to handling these 4 million triangles effortlessly? Mm -hmm. Something else is going on here. Let's okay. unravel this further. Yeah. If we're okay. looking at a single quad, that's yeah. composed of two triangles, which mm -hmm. are themselves composed of four vertices. It's not a whole lot. If we expand that out to a full screen of quads, we get somewhere in the ballpark of 4 million triangles, mm -hmm. and thus roughly 4 million vertices in total. If you yeah. think about a screen having 2 no, million... No wait, 4 million triangles? That's not 4 million vertices. 
Oh wait, but be they are connected, right? If it's if it's a connected grid, then they are shared. Yeah, they are shared. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's and why. Pixels already, brilliant. and we're able to do many, many, many the full screen uses passes, the yeah, and all of the associated shader computation that comes with it. That number of vertices isn't impressive. We can try out a few different numbers to see how this affects things. Mm -hmm. We already know that a single quad is pretty quick, but what happens as we increase the number of quads and thus the number of triangles and vertices? We can start out by just doubling the number of quads used, and we don't see much in the way of difference in performance. If anything is happening, it's pretty minor at best. But as we scale the count up aggressively, as we make the size of the quad smaller, and thus the number of quads needed to... Uh, oh, wait, so that's the performance in FPS, I see. ...fill up the screen increases, effectively increasing the triangle density on the screen, we start to notice a drop-off in performance. Initially, it's nothing crazy, but what we see is that it's not a gradual decline, there's a real drop-off at some point. Mm. Between tiles roughly sized 4x4, that's 4 pixels high and 4 pixels wide, and then two by two, we see this absolutely catastrophic drop off in performance. Mm -hmm. It's just bananas how bad this gets. Let's talk a bit about how GPUs work to yep. get a better understanding of why this is failing so badly. There's this really great post by NVIDIA called Life of a Triangle, NVIDIA's logical pipeline, that mm -hmm. kind of gives you a behind the scenes look at what happens between that API call and when things finally appear on the screen. AMD also has a really great talk entitled All the Pipelines, Journey Through the GPU, which has a nice overview of the different stages that basically happen between you attempting to draw something and pixels appearing on the screen. We'll loosely follow along with NVIDIA's, but I'll provide you with a link to the AMD one in the description. So if we imagine things starting out in our own code, we'll initiate the whole thing with some sort of GL draw elements, VK, CMD, Vulkan, draw indexed, or like this. Yeah, Vulkan, yeah. Draw stuff, we'll start the program here, draw side, driver side, check draw parameters, GPU, draw parameters, convert to GPU draw parameters. Okay, so basically that's the driver thing that's implemented by Vulkan and OpenGL that we don't even see most of the time. Draw call. In WebGL, this might look something like gl.drawElements. Mm -hmm. Vulkan might be something like vk command draw indexed, etc. I mean, these specific commands aren't important. No. What happens now is that the driver goes ahead and validates whatever you sent, making sure the data even makes sense before prepping it into a GPU-friendly format. Mm -hmm. That makes its way over to the GPU, which does some processing. Let's just kind of skim this. The important takeaway here is that it creates batches of triangles to work on, and these are sent to these parts of the GPU yeah, it can, that NVIDIA calls It allocates calls memory, or you already have memory allocated, and then it iterates over PCs, that memory. Right? or graphics processing clusters. Let's not wander too far off into the weeds here, but let's just mentally go with the idea of GPCs as being capable of handling a portion of the graphics rendering independently from others. Mm -hmm. So obviously then, the more you have of these, the better, because that means your GPU can theoretically do more work simultaneously. Mm -hmm. The important part at this stage is that these will grab the vertex data for them. That's why on graphics cards, if it says amount of CUDA cores, that's essentially it, right? The more you have, the faster it can be, potentially. Triangles and begin scheduling work for each vertex. It'll do the vertex processing at this point, and the NVIDIA doc goes over various tricks and optimizations they use, which aren't super important for the sake of simplicity. In the AMD talk, they specifically refer to this as the primitive assembler, or PA stage, mm -hmm. whose job is to put together a triangle and then forward that onto the rasterization stage. This is a bit like a step in an assembly line that takes a bunch of pieces, the individual vertices, and builds your primitives for you, usually yeah. triangles. The next stage basically involves figuring out who's going to be doing the fragment shader work. So at a course level, they're That's kind the of testing shader, the triangle right? against quads on the screen and divvying up the work. You can see on NVIDIA's, depending on the screen rectangles, they're handing off the work to different GPCs, and AMD has a similar note about doing some scan conversion to test triangle overlap. The end result is a bunch of fragment or pixel shader work is getting queued up. So what it does here is it gets these 2x2 two two quads of pixels, that's 4 pixels per quad, and queues those up together. You can see both NVIDIA and AMD both reference this. And the simple reason mm -hmm. is that at that size, 
they can do some efficient calculations. Stuff like texture gradients for mip mapping, well, a 2x2 quad has just enough information to do that, while not being more complex to implement from a hardware point of view. So pretty much everyone will do this. At this point, there's a bit more work to do depth testing, blending, various other operations before finally getting output, but that's how pixels are born. One obvious question that falls out of this is, if 2x2 two two quads of pixels are the smallest possible unit the GPU works with, what happens if I draw a triangle smaller than that? Yeah. Good question. And this is where you're realizing <laughs> that GPUs are Good basically question. built with, you could say, that it's an assumption about what you're going to draw. And that's pretty reasonable. Hardware okay. engineers are looking for ways to maximize the GPU's potential and then teach you what to oh, do. Oh, I understand. So that's why you use, I understand now. So that is why you use LOD, level of detail, because maybe a triangle can be fit into that small size and that's why it gets too low. Is that possible? Do and what not to do. So basically, there's an assumption that there's a given ratio between triangle size and pixels covered. And at some point past this, they'll still support whatever it is you're trying to do, but, but in slow. a very disapproving way. Mm. When you try to draw something smaller, the GPU absolutely can still do it. Well, what happens is that you've got this 2x2 two two quad, which is kind of like the smallest unit the GPU works with. Mm -hmm. The triangle inhabits this quad here. What happens to the other three? The answer is that the GPU still does the work, but then it just throws away the result. Oh. In fact, it's always doing this. Just most of the time, you don't notice it. In this case, it threw away 75% of the work, but let's imagine that we have a bigger triangle. So let's look at a bigger screen here, and then we've got a triangle that's being rendered. So it's touching a bunch of pixels, right? Except we now know that the GPU works with quads. So it's actually touching a whole bunch of quads, some mm -hmm. of which lie right on the edges of the triangle. All of these quads here that lie on the edge of the triangle, they, they will have be pixels decorated. that lie within yep. the triangle. But and this some that work don't. is discarded. But yep. the GPU will perform the work for the entire quad each time. There's not much you can do about this. Good. It's a natural consequence of rendering. Wait a minute. Shouldn't it calculate this too here? Simply because it touches this? Or is there like a is there like a calculation that says, oh well, we're not hitting the middle point enough of one of the four rasterizations or rasters so that it will never be filled it works by points not by lines i think yeah i think it works by points so not enough of this is filled right some of this work the gpu is just going to have to throw away it'll be wasted but what you can affect is what kind of triangles you feed to the gpu really small triangles are an obvious terrible case mm -hmm. you get really poor quad utilization throwing away an obscene amount of gpu performance but we can go a bit further and examine different topologies for a mesh. By topology, I mean the way the vertices are arranged to form the mesh. Mm -hmm. You can triangulate a mesh in many ways, and it's important to understand that they're not all treated the same by the- I wonder how, I wonder how uh, Nanite works into this. I wonder what GPU. Nanite does. Emil Person, a senior graphics engineer at Epic Games, known extremely well within graphic circles as Hummus, has a great blog, which I've referenced in the past. For mm -hmm. example, in the last video, I talked about occlusion systems, and one point I made was based on a talk he did for Avalanche Games. Anyway, there's a nice article talking about how the topology of a mesh affects the performance. What the article goes into detail is examining how different triangulations of the same mesh result in different performance, mm -hmm. while things like the mesh's area, or other things like number of triangles, are kept constant. The findings shouldn't surprise us, as we can see what the test... Nanite just adds more triangles as you get closer to the camera. Um, but what about far away? Does it, does it do its own triangulation? So basically, remove triangles. Nanite does hybrid rasterization using a software derivative of the original pipeline. It removes them per pre-calculates models. I see. So basically, if you have a model in there, it calculates the different LODs itself. And it's a form of automatic LOD, isn't it? It looks like it, yeah. did was to increase the number of vertices in gauge performance. We can see that the max area approach worked out best, while making ever thinner triangles did poorly. 
and you already know why. Mm -hmm. Because you end up with poor quad utilization, and thus the GPU does a lot of work that's that it crazy. has to throw away. As Emil's research. So I wonder if it's possible to create like an algorithm in C++. I mean, they did it, right? Like uh, Unreal Engine, if you're in your own engine that calculates this shit yourself. Showed the specific way that a mesh is triangulated has a very direct impact on performance and better triangulation can lead to better quad utilization really cool. and thus less wasted work from the GPU. So given that understanding, what happens now if instead of one quad per pixel, what happens if we push things further? Let's start upping the number and we'll go to four quads per pixel oh or gosh. nine quads per pixel or even 16 quads per pixel. Or Can whatever. you even render this? And what you'll see is that the frame rate will start to tank further and further. It's a lot of triangles, but not that many. It's about 2 million to start and grows to 8 million, 18, 32 million. This was an interesting topic of exploration on G Truk's blog, who was looking at the effect of subpixel triangles on performance. As they noted near the bottom, as you crank the number of vertices up, the frame rate absolutely tanks, mm -hmm. even if you're rendering to lower resolution. This post is quite old now, and I don't have access to the exact same setup that was used there, so my numbers don't match exactly. But I am seeing terrible performance, which is realistically all that matters. I guess, yeah, that's what matters. This goes back to the idea that your GPU is this super powerful monster that can take on anything, and a bunch of triangles, <laughs> in the grand <laughs> scheme of things, isn't that much. Mm -hmm. So then, what's behind this drop in performance? Let's revisit that primitive assembly stage. But, but this didn't time, we figure this out already? Through the lens of AMD's RDNA architecture, as detailed by their journey through the GPU talk. We touched on that earlier, where we can think of primitive assembly like a step in an assembly line that takes a bunch of pieces, the individual vertices, and builds your primitives for you, usually triangles. Mm. So on slide 19, on the RDNA architecture, we can see the various So essentially what he's saying is it takes a bunch of points and then it creates a, tr uh, a primitive like a triangle. Like So you have three points and then those three points build a triangle and then you can tell the GPU, well, reuse the previous two uh, vertices to build the next triangle with the next point. And so that's how it would build that. That's like basically the triangle strip or triangle list that you set so the in OpenGL. pipeline have been labeled. And there's this one here called the primitive assembler, which mm -hmm. as we know is important for assembling vertices into a yeah. triangle. That's and the primitive assembler. And then it outputs assembler. it to the next stage, which is often called rasterization. This is where it gets interesting. So, th so what I don't like here is why don't they add in the vertex shader? Green lines are vertex related. Yeah, I know, but you don't do... I mean, maybe this isn't the entire vertex shader. Command preprocessor, command list, indices, shader preprocessor input, then dual compute unit, basically compute this multiple times, then the shader export. Primitive is assembled in rasterization rasterizer. Okay. This will obviously vary from architecture to architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go and find the information sometimes. For example, we can look at the RDNA architecture white paper from AMD. This goes into some details on how the Navi class GPUs work. There's mm -hmm. a lot of info in here, but we can kind of focus on what we want from here, which is some info about primitive assembly. Specifically, they talk about how they scale the architecture. So as we can see, they have this detailed breakdown of how the Navi class GPUs, like the Radeon RX 5700 XT, which came out in 2019, we can see how they're structured. They consist of what are called shader engines. Mm -hmm. The Radeon RX 5700 XT has two of these, and within a shader engine, they're further divided into shader arrays, which contain, among other things, a primitive unit and a rasterizer. Mm -hmm. This is analogous to the NVIDIA setup we saw earlier, where they partitioned their GPUs into what were called GPCs, or graphics processing clusters. Mm -hmm. So the neat thing is then, you can connect that to this section later in the white paper, where they talk about how the primitive units assemble triangles. Let's just read this directly. The primitive units assemble triangles from vertices and are also responsible for fixed function tessellation. Each primitive unit has been enhanced and supports culling up to two primitives per clock, twice as fast as the prior generation. One primitive per clock is output to the rasterizer. Uh, I'm lost. So each primitive unit can output one primitive per clock. So while the GPU may be exceedingly powerful in some respects, for example, pixel processing, 
it's Lots still bound by the rate the primitive assembler can pass things off to the rasterization stage. Some deep info, so that's yeah. neat because it lets you know more specifically what the upper limit is for a given architecture on how fast these okay. things can just feed triangles to the rasterization stage. This is going to vary wildly from GPU to GPU, architecture to architecture. Maybe a good idea if you're working on a console and have some hard numbers to work against. But personally, I think it's Small just best to get good broad yeah, that's what idea. I got from By the throwing video more so and far. more vertices, even if they're not visible, you're forcing them through primitive assembly, yeah. which may kind of bottleneck things depending on the card you're using. Slightly older cards especially couldn't output that many primitives per clock, and so you'll end up starving later stages, since this is a bit like an assembly line. Mm -hmm. As Gtruc points out on their blog, let's say that you're dumping out a zillion small triangles, you're not making the most of the rasterization stage that follows it. In fact, a ton of performance is getting flushed down the toilet. So no, basically the, the assembly is what takes so long, right? The rasterization can't begin because you're still assembling. That is how it is, right? Now we have all the tools and foundation to go back to this simple optimization that we introduced at the beginning, but understanding at a much deeper level what's actually happening. Whatever your preconceptions of why level of detail worked, now you understand that the GPU really isn't all that good at rendering a bunch of micro triangles and spends a disproportionate yep. amount of computing so power that's doing why it. So that's why you do level of detail, I see. Yeah, that's what we figured out earlier, right? It's a bit but long explanation. I think the second part was a bit too confusing. Could have been used to make other stuff look more awesome. We also now understand that we are also inundating the GPU with useless small triangles, which beyond all that 2x2 two two quad stuff, you're forcing this to go through primitive assembly. A few years ago, Unreal unveiled Nanite, yeah. a really interesting new technology that I'm sure you've heard of by now. Yep. But if you haven't, no worries. Unreal's Nanite is, in essence, a continuous and automatic level of detail system. They just needed a cool, catchy name. I was always like, what is this Nanite? This looks so crazy. Like, isn't that what you have in your body and stuff, you know? No need for artists to do this. Unreal handles it automatically. This would be cool if we could at some point, you know, when we go into our own engine, maybe we are able to reproduce that too. 2021 presentation entitled Nanite, a deep dive. And one interesting thing that pops up is they confirm a lot of what we've talked about here. On this page, about 80 pages in, this is a very long presentation. Micro tile, 4x4. They Output two by two pixel quads, highly parallel in, pix in pixels, not triangles. Some technical decisions they made. Mm -hmm. We can see here that they mention just how crappy tiny triangles are. And yeah. they point out that GPUs are built with parallel pixels in mind, but not triangles. Which jives with what we've seen. I mean, they're the Epic team. They've done their homework. As they mentioned in their slides, a lot of modern GPUs can set up four triangles per clock max. So... So a primitive assembly bottleneck is a very real problem that they set out to solve, or at least work around. So what they did was to write a software rasterizer for micro triangles, and that ended mm -hmm. up being considerably faster. We don't have to understand it. A software rasterizer, so basically, yeah, they triangulate themselves. Details of their implementation, but now at least we understand their motivation. If you think you'd like to learn more about game dev from an experienced graphics engineer, I have a variety of courses available, very suitable for beginners. So if you find yourself right. wanting to get a bit better at game dev and delve a little deeper on some subjects, check them out. Otherwise, if you'd still like to support me and help choose what topic I cover oh, next, what you a can big vote chat. on my Patreon page. Has kids too. What a big chat. 20 years of experience. Really cool. Really nice. Four months ago. Yeah, that's a rather cool video. It was a little bit too detailed in the end. He lost me there. I'm not that deep into this crazy stuff, but it was still very, very informative. And now we can understand that the also magic Nanite from Unreal Engine isn't all that magical. It's in fact just level of detail.